Sunday school teachers is going to do our homily. So we invite all of the children to come forward so they can get a really close seat. All our children who want a closer seat are welcome to come. And just like it's baptism, we'll sit all around the front. We have a little bit of room for Saturday in the middle. So please get a little bit of room for this. All right. Well, those of you who know Michelle Place, our Christian Ed director, knows two characteristics about her. One, that she is always fully engaged, and that means moving, 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 fixing that problem, addressing that issue, helping things run smoothly in our Sunday schools. And secondly, she always does it with a smile on her face. What you may not know is that Michelle has one major stressor, and that is not having enough Sunday school teachers, ever. So I want you to prayerfully consider today, during this worship hour, as to whether you hear God calling your name to teach next year or to be a helper. With our roster of teachers, you won't have to teach more than one time a month. And you will be trained. You'll have a training class someday this summer. And if you miss that, you can come to a private training class in my home in August when I'm out for a knee replacement and recovery. Mm -hmm. So, there is something in the bulletin for you, a form to fill out, drop an offering plate, or you call the church office in the, um, tomorrow morning. Teaching your children for the past I think, 25 years has been one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life. Because your children have made me laugh. Once teaching the pre-K class, a little boy held up his hand, and before I had a chance to call on him, he said, you smell just like my grandma. <laughs> True story. Fortunately for me, because a, a dozen bad things were running through my mind at that time, bad breath, B.O., whatever. <laughs> Fortunately, his mom was my helper that day, and so I said, Mom, is smelling like grandma a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and she said, no, it's a good thing. You're, you wear the same perfume. Ah, happy. So your children have made me laugh. Your children have also made me cry. When doing a godly play, I'm sorry, when doing the Stations of the Cross for children, uh, about five years ago, uh, and, you know, I always tell the children, because I have beautiful pictures, not like the ones we use in the church that are really black and white. I have full-color pictures from children's books that explain those stations of the cross for children. And they're done by different artists. So one artist might show Jesus carrying the full cross. The other might just be the, the cross being on their shoulders. So I explain to them about different um, illustrators so they don't get, so it doesn't get in the way of understanding the lesson. And the last station is, of course, Jesus is laid in the tomb. And this particular illustration has the crowd of people coming down off the hill with the crosses in the background. And Jesus is draped over a donkey, so all we see is this, his upper back, his arms, and the crown of thorns on his head. And as we were leaving that last station on our way back to the parish hall, two sisters were in front of me, holding hands, and the little four-year-old looked at her older sister and said, did Jesus really, really die? And her sister said, yes. And as her faces were turned to each other, I saw the tears coming down. And then I realized that my face was wet, was wet as well. So your children have made me cry. Your children have also filled me with awe. And this happened this last, this past Palm Sunday. Oh, baby. Baby's cry, they do that, don't they? It's okay. So it's happened on Palm Sunday, and that's, I had all the children and for, from all ages, and we go through the story of Holy Week, starting with the Hosannas from Palm Sunday, and that lesson too ends with Good Friday, with Jesus in the tomb. We have 
a tomb, and those of you who've been in my class, you recognize this, right? So we have the tomb, you recognize that? And we have the figure of Jesus wrapped in white cloths. And he's inside the tomb with a huge rock rolled in front. And the lesson ends that day by my saying, and this is where the story ends today, with Jesus dead and alone in the tomb. And that's why a rock can be a symbol of great sadness, because it seals Jesus in. And when you leave today, I'm going to give each one of you, not today, which is what I say in class, I'm going to give each one of you a rock to take home, so that you remember and think about Jesus dying for you. But next Sunday, on Easter, we will learn that the rock also represents great joy because the stone is rolled away and Jesus is alive again. So off to my left is a little five-year-old boy who's been very attentive the whole time, and suddenly he shouts out, so it does have a happy ending. <laughs> and I said, yes, for Jesus and for us. And his face lit up and he spontaneously began to clap. And all the children began to clap, and I could only sit there looking at my helper like this. Because just like the lesson today, whoosh, that Holy Spirit was with us for that spontaneous joy from the children. But it also caused me a little bit of shame, because I had to ask myself, Norma, when was the last time you were spontaneously so happy, showing the world how joyous you are that your Redeemer lives? So your children challenge me too. So the godly play story is we sit in a circle and we teach simple stories, Bible stories. We have holy lessons about baptism. We have a historical lessons about Moses. Uh, we have the parables and we have enrichment lessons. So the children sit in a circle around me and the teacher sits on the floor too. You might notice it takes me a little bit longer to get up these days, okay? We tell the story, and after the story, there are what's called I wonder questions. For instance, for the story of creation, the lesson is plaques for each day of creation. So you tell the story and then you lay out the plaques. And at the end, one of the wondering questions is, I wonder if I could take out any one of God's days of creation and would we still have all we need? And the children can either answer out loud or answer in their own, own hearts. And it's okay if they don't answer out loud because they think about it. They ponder those questions. One mom told the story of she was taking her daughter to a gymnastics class from the back seat. A voice piped up and said, So, Mom, which one of the Ten Commandments do you think is the best one? <laughs> and mom said, It's been a long time since somebody challenged me about my faith. So it's okay. And then there's a response time. We can either have a guided craft or the children are free to do what they want. For instance, during the first Sunday in uh, Lent, we made a Lenten peace quilt. Some of you were the recipient of those, I'm sure. Uh, one time during the, the children had their own response. Once during the Good Samaritan, a child made a get well card for a neighbor. And then we say goodbye. So you will notice when we do the story in just a moment that I will not give eye contact to the students. Now, from having taught public speaking on the side for many years, that was a real disconnect for me. You know, you have to maintain eye contact with your audience to build that bond, build that connection. So not looking at the students, I, I couldn't get my head wrapped around that. But what I found, I, because I, the church sent me to a two and a half day training program, and I became so immersed in Bobby play that I had a paradigm shift. I went from thinking, well, that will never work, to, ah, oh, yes, I see how focusing on the story instead of the teacher helps that story to come alive. And I feel better because I'm not looking at the students and so they're not acting up. I mean, they're focused on the story. To borrow a phrase from the 
book from the Godly Play Story on Moses and the Ten Best Ways, at that training, I became so close to God, and God came so close to me that I understood that part of his plan was for me to teach. And I thank you for the opportunity for lending me your children someday. Before we go for the lesson, I want to ask the congregation four things. Number one, whatever happens here today is to the glory of God, not to the glory of Norma. So no applause, please. And secondly, don't strain to see because we're going to be up here. The story is flat and the pieces are small. So no matter how close you are, you won't be able to see. I would ask simply that you just listen. Close your eyes and listen. Imagine that I'm sitting there beside you telling you a story. Thirdly, allow yourself to feel whatever emotions you want to feel. Don't try to push them down. I don't want anyone to see me. And finally, when I ask the I wonder questions, I want you to think about what your responses are and consider them for the full week. Because we've lost, as adults, we've lost the ability to wonder, don't we? We Google or call Siri, right? So I want you to wonder and ponder these questions for a while. So now, the story. Just come on. Okay, you want to come on up? Everybody? I'm going to sit here. How about you sit on either side? Okay. Can you be my anchor right here? Okay, my hands are cold. Okay. We need to leave room, though, in the middle so that the recording can be made so that I'm ready to have some. Is that good, Scott? Wow. This is a fancy box, isn't it? It looks like a gift. Guess what? It is a gift. It's a gift that was given to us long ago. It contains a parable. A parable is a story, and that's the, it has a special meaning. And a parable is the way that Jesus liked to teach. And you may have heard this story before, the story of the Good Shepherd. But I would ask that you listen with different ears because you may have heard it when you were younger. And sometimes what it means to me now <coughs> may mean something different when I get older. So is everybody ready for the story to sit quietly and listen? Yes. Okay. When Jesus was teaching on the earth, he said such wonderful things and did such amazing things that people asked him who he was. Sometimes he gave different answers. But once, whenever he at me, once whenever he answered the question, he said, I am a good shepherd. I am a good shepherd. The good shepherd knows each one of his sheep by name. And my sheep know my voice. When I open the sheepfold, the sheep come out and follow me. They trust me. They know that I will lead them to the good green grass to eat. And I will lead them to the cool, clear water to drink. And sometimes we have to go through some dangerous places. The sheep don't want to go there. But they trust me, so they follow me. That's okay. So one by one, 
the sheep go through the dangerous places. But sometimes, a sheep can get lost. So that when the Good Shepherd is standing by the sheepfold, counting all his sheep as they come home, he will know if one is missing. And if one is missing, he will go back to find it. He'll go to the good green grass. He'll go to the cool, clear water. He'll even go back through the dangerous places. And when he finds that lost sheep, he puts it on his shoulder, no matter how heavy it is, and carries it home. <laughs> And he is so happy when all of his sheep are home that he has his friends and neighbors over for a great feast to celebrate that that book that was lost has now been found. Now, the ordinary shepherd doesn't really care about the sheep that much. It's just a job. He doesn't know the sheep. The sheep don't know his name. When he opens the sheepfold, he just goes by himself. So the sheep come out and they wander around. And when the wolf comes, you know, the wolf, the wolf likes to eat, he's hungry and he wants to eat one of the sheep. Well, when the wolf comes, the ordinary shepherd runs away. But the good shepherd stands firm between the wolf and the sheep so that the wolf runs away. One day, the good shepherd may even lay down his own life for the sheep. Shepherds usually have some sort of protection. Well, the good shepherd is very happy when all the sheep are home. Now you heard me ask, tell the people about the I wonder questions. So if you want to answer, you can answer out loud. Raise your hand. And if you don't want to answer, just keep the answer in your heart and think about it this week, okay? So I wonder if you have ever been in a dangerous place. Oh, yes, Rick? You were at a range? A shooting range, and that was a dangerous place? Okay. Yes. A BB gun range, okay. Yes. Down in the woods. Down in the woods. Woods can be scary. I wonder if you've ever been lost. Oh, a lot of answers on that. Yes. You were lost in a grocery store once. Let me see someone else that has an answer. Yes. Yes. A grocery store too? Yes. Lost at school. Lost at school? Okay. Yes. Way far back in the woods? Yes. I've been lost. I am out playing a game and I lost my dad in the line for a roller coaster. Okay, so you're playing a game and you lost your dad. Your dad lost you, or you lost your dad. I our dad wandering off like a sheep. Okay, one more. I lost. I was lost in a cornfield. Lost in a cornfield. In a corn maze. I think it's easy to get lost in a corn maze. Well, I wonder if you have ever been found. Yes. You were found at a grocery store. 
So a nice lady came up and guided you to your grandma. That was nice. She was a good Samaritan, wasn't she? Let's get somebody that hasn't answered yet. Does anybody that hasn't answered yet have a, have a response? And finally, I wonder if you have ever heard the Good Shepherd call your name. You know, our, many of our hymns have so much meaning, and a hymn that has particular meaning for me is called The King of Love My Shepherd Is. And verse 3 goes like this. Perverse and foolish, oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home, rejoicing, brought me. We're going to sing that verse. It's right under the, they're printed in the bulletin right under where the Godly Play session is. And I would like each of you, when we get to the word rejoicing, don't sing that word. Just shout it out. <laughs> 